All right, so the first part of these notes should be pretty review-y um, as we start to get into writing proper chemical formulas and naming compounds. First of all, um, all atoms are electrically neutral. We learned about this back in the atom days, and that's because all atoms have the same number of protons and electrons. So again, we are talking about atoms being electrically neutral because they have the same number of protons and electrons. And of course, we remember that protons are positive, the electrons are negative. So when we have the same number of each, that makes them neutral. We've talked about, however, that atoms aren't the only things on this planet. We have these ions. And so what exactly is an ion? Well, an ion is an atom or group of atoms that has a positive or negative charge. And these, ad these ions are formed by gaining and losing electrons. We won't talk about messing with the protons in the nucleus of an atom until we get to nuclear chemistry later in the year. But by gaining or losing these electrons, an atom can become a positive ion by losing the negative electrons, or a negative ion by gaining those electrons. Why is this happening, though? And remember when we, back in the periodic table unit, I had a picture of a Smurf in a knight outfit, and I said that the ions were on a quest for nobility. And that's exactly what's going on. They want to be stable. They want to be like the idols of stability, the noble gases. And that is happening because of the full valence shell of electrons, the magic number of eight. There are a few elements, the little guys, hydrogen, lithium, and beryllium, that look for the magic number of two, like helium. But everyone else is on that quest for nobility in order to become stable like a noble gas. This, of course, is from the wonderful picture Monty Python and the Holy Grail. If you ever have a chance, check that one out when maybe you're punished for the weekend or something. But remember that we've got these two types of ions. We've got cations, which are positive, and the anions, which are negative. Remember that our metals are the ones that are going to be losing electrons and becoming the positive cations, while our anions, not anions, ha ha ha, the anions are being formed from the nonmetals. Now our first little dip into the naming pool comes from naming these ions. Since the majority of our elements are metals, most of the ions formed are cations, so we don't mess with their names too much. So when calcium loses two electrons, it becomes the calcium ion. Aluminum loses three electrons, becomes the aluminum ion. Magnesium loses two electrons, becomes the magnesium ion. And we might have to add some middle names to these cations here in a moment, but for the most part, you do not mess with the elemental name when you're talking about a cation. But you do want to add the word ion to distinguish. The negative ions, they change their ending and become ides. So when chlorine loses one electron, it becomes the chloride ion. Sulfur becomes sulfide, bromine becomes bromide. And so now you can kind of see where some of our names of our compounds come from. Salt, for example, table salt, is sodium chloride. It's made from a sodium ion and a chloride ion. Now your notes packet says complete the ide table on the back of the notes packet. There's not that many negative ions as far as the elements are concerned, so I thought we could put them all together in one spot. So here you see nitride, phosphide, and arsenide. They will be negative three charged ions. We've got some negative two ions, oxygen and his family friends, oxide, sulfide, selenide, and telluride. The halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, they form negative one ions, fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. And there's a couple polyatomic ions that we should mention here, since they also end in ide, cyanide, hydroxide, and peroxide. So here we have a nice little list of the ides that will come in handy when we're writing some of these ionic formulas. 
Now, we know that these elements become ions because they're trying to become stable. Metals will lose them, become cations. Nonmetals will gain electrons, become anions. But what about those charges? Where do the numbers come from? How do I know plus 2 or plus 3 or minus 2 or minus 3 or even plus 4 and plus 5? That's because these elements have a kind of predictable way that they gain or lose electrons. Again, stability is the key. And so we are looking for the atoms to have a lower potential energy. When something is unstable, it has a high potential energy, like a spring to really smash together. It has the ability to do something amazing. And so we want everything to become more stable, and that's why we're forming these ions. The representative A elements, they are going to ionize in a more predictable fashion. Remember, that's the S and P block on our periodic table, groups 1 and 2 and 13 through 18. The transition metals and inner transition metals are not so predictable. They can form multiple ions, as we'll see here in a minute. And of course, the noble gases do not form ions. They are stable. And so this is where... I put together for you the super friendly ion card. And that top part there you see shows the representative A elements. So group one are alkali metals, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. They always form plus one ions. Why? We'll take rubidium for example. Rubidium has 37 electrons. When it loses one, it ends up with 36 electrons. Who else has 36 electrons? Well, that would be krypton, a noble gas. And so that is why rubidium will always form a plus one ion. The group two, alkaline earths, same thing, like calcium, for example. Calcium always loses two. Calcium has 20 electrons. When it loses two, it ends up with 18. And that is just like the noble gas argon. Pardon my awful penmanship with my mouse. Across the gap, the transition metal gap, we've got a couple plus three ions, aluminum and gallium. Don't worry about the other elements. We will either won't use them very often or they're not very chemically relevant. Boron, for example, doesn't really form ions. In group 14, uh, carbon, and silicon and germanium, again, not really forming ions. Tin, lead, bismuth, and antimony, they are going to be in the table below this one. And then over here we see all of our ides. The ides that we just listed on the lovely ide chart on the back of your notes. And of course, the noble gas is not forming ions. The second part of your ion card shows the B elements, metals, that form more than one type of ion. And so we, this is where I'm talking about giving the ion a middle name. So take, for example, here lead. Lead can be plus 2 and plus 4. So I can't just say the lead ion. So we can do a classical name, the plumbus and plumbic ion. Notice all the OUSs have the lower number charge. The ICs have the higher number charge for all of these ions. That's one way to distinguish them. We also, I tend to use the stock name, the more modern name. So the lead 2 ion means that it's a plus 2. So the 2 there matches the 2 there. Lead 4 ion, IV, Roman numeral, matches the plus 4. The lower part of your chart here, there are, of course, exceptions. Welcome to chemistry. So these three inner or transition metals, silver, cadmium, and zinc, they're like pseudo-A's. They only form one charged ion, so they're very predictable that way. And then, of course, hydrogen. Hydrogen can be a plus one hydrogen ion by losing one electron, or a minus one hydride ion by gaining one electron. So that's just a little glimpse at your super friendly ion card, which we will get plenty of use out of for the next several weeks and throughout the rest of the year.